Um, one of the things that I'm, I love about my work is these principles that I share and these principles that I'm most passionate about uh, have very high utility. These are things that will help you personally and professionally. They'll help you individually and they'll help you organizationally. Um, again, when you, when you look at principles of high utility, you know, the, the foundation and the fundamentals don't change. So in order to be really impactful, influential leaders, there's three core areas that I think we need to raise uh, our clarity on. And the very first one, which I believe is the fundamental, the, the foundation uh, of effective leadership is our perspective on how we view leadership. And I'm a huge believer in the foundational mantra of transformational leadership, which is choosing to see the world through the lens of, it's not about me, it's about you. I believe you should be able to look every member of your family in the eye and say the same thing. Spouses, children, significant others, it's not about me, it's about you. Your team, each other, peers here, it's not about me, it's about you. Now, to clarify, this does not mean that you think less of yourself. This does not mean you don't prioritize your own self-care and fill your own bucket in order to pour into others. This means you value other people's dreams, other people's goals, other people's, you, you double down on their strengths, you utilize all of that different stuff um, as much as you do your own. So it's not about me, it's about you. When you can shift your focus off of what you want from people and put your focus on what you want for people, it's an absolute game changer. It makes you the most magnetic leader in the room at any given moment. There's a quote that I use a lot. I am not the original person to come up with this. I can't find who is or I would give them proper attribution. But uh, it really rings true, especially in leadership. And that is a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And ultimately, as leaders, that's the business we're in. We are in the business of lighting other people's candles. And it doesn't make your light shine any dimmer when you light somebody else's. So that was pillar number one with leadership, and that's our perspective. Any other thoughts or questions on perspective? Remember, it's not about you, it's about them. All right, so let's go to our second one, which would be core values. Here's why being crystal clear on your personal code of values is so important. It makes decision-making so much more fluid. Now, this doesn't mean you don't have really hard decisions to make. That is part of being a leader. But it means now you have a, a framework to make the decision-making that much more fluid. Because every single decision you make, every single behavior you have, every single interaction with a member of your team, you have to ask yourself, is this in alignment with my core values or not? And I don't expect anyone in the room to be perfect. I'm definitely not batting a thousand. I don't have all straight A's in this department. But the goal as leaders is to make as many decisions as possible, as consistently as possible, in alignment with your core values. If you come to a fork in the road, just ask yourself, is this in alignment with my core values? If it is, you do it. If it isn't, all I ask is you at least take a breath, take a beat, before you proceed with doing something that is not in alignment with the person that you're trying to become. Because keep this in mind, from a core value standpoint, your team can't become something you're not. You can't lead your team somewhere you're not going. So once again, this goes back to the, you can't use the do as I say, not as I do mentality. I would imagine that if we did generate a list of core values, and maybe we'll do that in just a moment, that not only do you want to make sure you're living in alignment with them, you probably feel so strongly about these things. These are traits and values that you would hope your team would emulate. And if that's the case, then it goes back to we have to model it. If we expect it for others, we have to model it ourselves. True in leadership, true in parenting, true in coaching. So get crystal clear on your core values. Use those as the framework to make all decisions. And you know what this does? When you learn to make decisions based on core values, it makes you consistent. And consistency is really, really important when it comes to leadership. We'll jump into our, our third pillar of where we need to heighten clarity, and that's gonna be purpose. Staying connected to purpose. And we've got two, you've got your purpose as a leader, but then you've also got the omnicell purpose, the existence of the organization, why it even exists. And we need to stay connected to both. And then part of being an exceptional leader is making sure the team stays connected 
to both and that they have some understanding of that, that purpose. And use this as a framework, so write this down. We help X do Y so that they can Z. And you're on some level with your group, try to fill in the X, Y, and Z. If that exact terminology is too constrictive, you don't have to use it. That is just an example. Now, if you ask the members of your team to do the same exercise, how confident are you that their answer would be fairly aligned? Doesn't have to be word for word, because we're not looking to create a, a group of stoic robots that just can repeat that. The point is being able to live it. It has nothing to do with whether you could recite it on command at a cocktail party. It has to do with whether or not you believe this, you feel this, and it is what you use as the North Star to make all of the decisions that you make. But it might be an interesting exercise to do with your teams. You know, ask them to come up with theirs and see how in alignment they are with each other, how in alignment their answer is with yours. Um, yeah, it, it, I think uh, anytime we can lay, increase awareness or expose a potential blind spot, it's a really good thing. It might be uncomfortable in the moment, the same way feedback can be uncomfortable in the moment. But I think it'd be pretty important to know if a couple members of your, each of your respective teams has a different purpose than what your purpose is. Don't we want everybody kind of running in the same direction? And once again, this is an invitation. This is not, I can't believe you wrote that, this is our purpose. That's not leadership. We lean in with curiosity and fascination. Wow, your purpose statement is vastly different than mine. Or one of the X, you know, uh, XYZs is different. I'm really fascinated with how you came up with that. I'd love to learn more about why you think that should be our X or our Y or our Z and see what they come up with. And then true to the repetition of preparation, whatever this purpose statement is, this needs to be talked about all of the time. Again, it doesn't have to be read and recited, but it's something that we, like every decision we make, are we ultimately serving that Z at the end and, and being able to work backwards. I love that concept of start with the end in mind and then work backwards. All right, so now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna cover three pillars of individual performance. So habits, by definition, habits are the things we do consistently and the things we do unconsciously. And the goal is to try to create as many habits as possible that are in alignment with our own personal North Star. See, if my, for me, and that's all I'll do, I'll just speak openly about my North Star and then you guys can apply that however you'd like. Mine is more about the person I'm trying to become, less about achievements or accolades or things to do. And yeah, I have tangible bucket lists, place I'd like to visit and things I'd like to do, but most of it is, is around the person I'm trying to become. So the person I'm trying to become is someone that is physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually fit. Someone that finds great purpose in the work that he does and feels like he's making a meaningful contribution in service of others. Someone that has very strong relationships with his kids and, and everybody that's important in his life. Like that's, without getting too granular, that's my North Star. So I work really hard to try to create habits and systems and processes in my life that greatly increase the chance that that's the person that I'll become. I try to make as many decisions as I can that are in alignment with becoming that person. And the reason that's important is it doesn't mean I'm postponing anything. It, it's, this is not like I'll be happy when, or I'll be this person when, because the thing is, when you make decisions in alignment with the person you're trying to become, you're making those decisions in real time which means you'll reap the benefit in real time. So the key to me being physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually fit when I'm almost 70, I make those decisions now and live those out when I'm almost 50. So we have to take a look at our habits. All right, so now let's move to the next pillar, which is mindset. So mindset is really just the perspective at which we see the world. I'm a huge believer, and this is, this is for me, but uh, as with all of this, I'm not here to tell you all what to do. I'm just here to share some things that have worked for me, some principles and some strategies and approaches that I've seen work for countless others, and then you decide what's the right fit for you. But for me, the, the definition of having a winning mindset is simply making the commitment to do the best, do you, the can best you can with what you have, with what you wherever have, you are, wherever you are, full stop. This will give us a chance to unpack. I know one of the questions that we wrote down earlier, one of the pain points was with some of the adversity and some of the challenges and some of the things that pop up that are outside of our control. All of those things are very valid. But let's continue to make the commitment and lead our teams and encourage our teams to do the best we can with what we have wherever we are. 
The reason I like that as an operating system for me personally is that mindset eliminates a trilogy of behaviors that I know from firsthand experience, because I used to be the king of all three of these things when I was in my 20s and arguably early 30s, and that is blaming, complaining, and making excuses. I know from firsthand experience that those three things will limit your productivity, they'll limit your effectiveness, they'll limit your fulfillment and joy, blaming, complaining, and making excuses. While I do believe all three of those are very understandable, I also personally believe they're all three very unacceptable. And I try to drastically reduce my own blaming, complaining, making excuses, because when I, and remember, I didn't say eliminate, I'm human, I'm fallible. What I can say with a tremendous amount of pride and a huge smile is I blame, complain, and make excuses less today than at any other previous time in my life. Still not, still not perfect, no, no straight A's on that report card, but it's better, and it is going in the right direction. I derive, I derive a tremendous amount of satisfaction over progress. So I love knowing that as I continue to get older and hopefully wiser and more effective as a human being, I will blame, complain, and make excuses even less. I'm at the point now that it rarely happens that I blame, complain, or make an excuse, but when I do, I catch myself doing it rather quickly, and I at least acknowledge it as opposed to before, before in my 20s and 30s, I had no clue I was even doing that. I was so unaware and, and borderline self-righteous that I thought every single one of those blames, complaints, and making excuse, like excuses was justified. And the thing to remember when it comes to that is I'm not saying that whatever we're tempted to blame, complain, or make an excuse about is not valid. Most of those things are incredibly valid. I'm saying they're not gonna help you. It's not helping you to do that. So that goes back to my statement earlier about I'm not trying to add stuff to my life, I'm trying to untether from the things that don't serve me. And blaming, complaining, and making excuses does not serve me. And I think I can make a pretty good argument it doesn't serve you either. In fact, I'll be as brash as to say blaming, complaining, and making excuses will never ever improve your situation or make things better. So focus really has to do with where we choose to place our attention. So we've kind of loosely agreed, I didn't really poll you guys, but we kind of loosely agreed that time is our most precious resource. And if that's true, then I believe our attention is the most valuable currency we have and where we choose to place our attention. Generally speaking, in order for us to perform at the highest level possible, we wanna get all of our faculties in alignment and focused primarily in the present moment because that's really all that we have as consistently as we can. So when we talk about what it is that we want to focus on, even those of you that heard me four or five years ago, I most likely provided this acronym and I'm going to provide it again. And if you guys ever have me back in the future, I'll tell you for a third time. And that is the acronym WIN, W-I-N, which stands for what's important now. Am I currently choosing to place my attention in what I believe is most deserving of it in this moment? And I say that with no judgment. If you believe whatever is on your phone is what's most important in this moment, then by all means, look at your phone. There's nothing wrong with that. But I just want us to have ownership over that. I don't want you to think having dinner with your family is the most important thing at this moment and you're looking at your phone. Now you're not being in alignment with what it is that you believe and how you behave, which is ultimately what we're trying to do for all of us. We want to align our behaviors and our beliefs as consistently as we can. Nothing wrong with looking at your phone, nothing wrong with having dinner with your family, but decide which one is most important at that moment. And if you make that a constant recalibration tool, you can course correct fairly quickly because all of us will find ourselves at multiple times throughout the day, many times unconsciously giving our attention to something that we don't believe is most important in that moment. So that gives us a chance to course correct. Another phrase that I love is be where your feet are. And that's ultimately what we're talking about. Learn to be where your feet are. Which just means wherever you are in the physical, make sure that's where you are in the mental, emotional, and spiritual as well. Because we've all been with someone, but not really been with someone. You might be in the physical presence, but mentally and emotionally, you're completely somewhere else. And that happens. But we need to have an awareness of when it happens so that we can course correct. 
Because that's what we're talking about with focus. And, and it starts with awareness. In order for you to be focused, you have to be aware of when you're unfocused, of when you're distracted, of when your mind wanders. It goes back to what I said earlier. The first step to improvement is always awareness. You will never fix something you're unaware of. You will never improve something you're oblivious to. So the only way you can be focused on what you want to be focused on is when you're aware of when you aren't. Because I'm a systems and processes guy, that's my operating system and my preference, I try to create environments that it's less tempting for me to be unfocused. If you and I are having lunch and I have my phone and it's face up, I'm most likely going to be tempted to look at it and then not give you my full attention. I know that about myself. So there's a variety of steps. I can turn all of my notica notifications off and silence it. I can turn my phone face down. I can leave it in the car. Like there's varying degrees of the steps I can take if I decide that giving you my attention is what's most important, and I believe in this case it is. So can I create an environment where I don't have to rely on sheer willpower? And think about that in every single area of our life. So let's, let's shift gears into the team portion now. So we covered three pillars of, of leadership performance, three pillars of individual performance. Now we'll look at three pillars of team performance. I, I'm under the impression Every single organization or team on the planet has a culture, every single one of them. The question, there's only two questions. One, is it high performing or low performing? Or I guess there'd be a, a, a mediocre performing. And was it designed with intention or did they walk into it backwards? That's the, the only questions I have. Every single organization has a culture. The question is, is it high performing or low performing? And did you design it with intention or did you just blindly walk into it? But everybody's got a culture. Just like we talked about earlier, every single person on the planet has a morning and evening routine. Everyone does. It's just a matter of, is it one that serves you or is it one that doesn't? And did you design your morning routine or do you just wake up and just start following habits that you've blindly created? But everybody's got a routine because as human beings, we are creatures of habit. So I'll share how I look at culture. And I believe culture is simply how well aligned your behaviors and your beliefs are and the experience that everyone related to the organization has in working with you. So in your case, it's those of you that are on the team and those of you that you, that you serve. So first it's behaviors and beliefs. Here are our beliefs. These are our core values. These are our standards. These are expectations. These are our key activities. That's what you believe. How well and how consistently does everyone on the team do those things? The answer to that is how how, what type of culture you have. When you have a team that consistently, the vast majority of people model and live the behaviors that you've all agreed to, you have a high performing culture. If very few people or very rarely live up to the core values and the, the key activities and standards, then you have a low performing culture. And all of that will yield the experience. When someone says the word omnicell, whether inside or outside of the organization, what does that elicit? What type of response? What's the experience that somebody has? That's a defining moment of the culture. So now begs the question, and again, that's my definition. Doesn't mean you have to adopt it, but hopefully that stimulated some thought. It's, it's how well aligned are your behaviors and your beliefs? Then the question is, all right, well, how do we improve that? How do we improve the alignment between what we say we believe and how we actually behave on a daily basis? And this is why it's so important from a culture standpoint. You look at the entire org chart. This is just as important for the people at the top of the org chart as it is on the bottom of the org chart. It doesn't matter what division you're in, what department you're in, how long you've been there, your title, your tenure, it doesn't matter. If you are a part of this team, the way you behave matters and is the way you behave in alignment with what it is that you all say you believe? That's the question. And our goal is to, to create as much alignment or, or congruency as we can. So that will lead us to the three pillars right now that we'll discuss, which is role clarity, accountability, and communication. With some of the awesome stuff that you guys shared earlier, we've covered some of this. So these three will go quicker than some of the previous three because we've already touched on them. Role clarity. Everybody on the team, regardless of title or tenure, regardless of where they fall on the org chart, every single person on the team has to know their role, 
has to embrace their role and has to strive to star in their role to the best of their ability. The reason that can become difficult is on any team, there are some people who have roles that aren't what they want their role to be, but it's what the team needs it to be for the team to be successful. In basketball analogy, that would be the backup point guard. They'd probably prefer to be the starting point guard in most instances, but that's not what would be best for the team. So they have to accept a role that is, is different than the one that they want, but it's the one that the team needs. So we have to know, embrace, and aim to star in your role, regardless of what your role is. One of the hardest parts of leadership is getting people to know, embrace, and star in a role that's not one of their choosing. Everybody else on the team, and we covered this earlier, needs to value, respect, and appreciate everybody else's role. This can be very hard because as human beings, when we get siloed and we get in our own ecosystem and our own world, it's easy for us to neglect or diminish or not as strongly appreciate what other people are doing because we don't see it every single day. We're not around it every single day. We see what we see. So from a role clarity standpoint, those two things have to be the foundation. So back to accountability. This goes back to feedback being a gift that we talked about earlier. I think in this case, accountability and feedback are rather synonymous. I believe accountability is a gift. I believe holding someone accountable is something you do for them. It's not something you do to them. Holding someone accountable is the best gift you can give them because ultimately what you tell them is, I care about you. I care about us. I'm not going to let you get away with doing less than you're capable of. I'm not going to let you get away with doing less than the standard we've agreed upon. I'm not going to let you get away with doing less than the expectations we've agreed upon. With that being said, we have to appreciate that we're always communicating something. Even when you're not speaking, you're communicating. Some of that is through our nonverbals, uh, our, our body language, our posture, our facial expressions, our tone when we are speaking. But a lot of that is in unconscious messages that we're sending. We said earlier that if you're sitting with someone at lunch, but you're staring at your phone the whole time, you're sending them an unconscious message. The unconscious message is what's on my phone is more important than you. And sometimes that is the case and that's okay. I just want to make sure that you own that message and that you communicate that message effectively. Where I see this a lot is in delegation. As leaders, you guys need to be able to delegate effectively. If not, you'll always be the bottleneck to massive movement and progress. When you delegate something of importance to someone else on the team, you unconsciously tell them that I trust you, I believe in you, and I think you're good enough to do this. That's why I'm asking you to do it. That will strengthen your relationship with that person. They'll know you believe in them, trust in them, and know they're good enough. If we delegate and then we micromanage, we either literally or figuratively stand over someone's shoulder and breathe down their neck, we send the opposite unconscious message. The unconscious message you send then is, I don't believe in you, I don't trust you, and I don't think you're good enough to get this done unless I'm standing over you. Now, that's not what you mean, but that's what they receive. There's an adage I learned very early in my coaching career that holds true today in every aspect of life. It's not what you say, it's what they hear. And there can often be a gap between those two things. All right, let's pivot into change. This is the last one. Just know there's two types of change. There's change that's imparted on you and there's change that you initiate goes back to control versus, uh, controllables versus uncontrollables. Like the change that was imparted on all of us several years ago was a global pandemic. We didn't really get a vote on that. Then there's the change that we initiate, which is the primary change I want you to focus on when you leave here today. What are the things that we discussed or talked about or exercises that you are going to initiate to create a change? Just remember, if nothing changes, nothing changes. So you guys have brought up a few different things that you'd like to see changed moving forward, and I think that's fantastic. Well, in order to get a different result or response, then you have to have a different input. Something needs to change. Because if you keep doing what you've been doing, you will keep getting what you've been getting. If you don't like what you've been getting, you need to change what you've been doing. Back to the basics, simple. 
I mean, what they, they say that's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing but expecting a different result. I mean, by that definition, most people walking the earth are insane. <laughs> I'm certainly guilty of that as much as anybody. So we have to have an awareness of something we want to see change, and then we have to change the input to get a different output. Now, when it comes to change, the first thing is that awareness. I've said that numerous times today, but it's because it's that important. If you're not aware of it, or not aware that a change needs to be made, one will not happen. The second is you have to have an understanding of what needs to be changed and what's at risk if it doesn't. And then the third part is we have to recondition our behaviors. We have to actually make the change. Implementation, execution. I see many of you have been taking some really copious notes this entire time, which I think is amazing. If you just go home and you close that notebook and you put it in a file cabinet, you never visit it again and you don't implement anything on the paper, nothing in your life will change. I can promise you that. Not a single thing. If nothing changes, Nothing changes. You guys are all incredibly high performers. And the reason you're high performers is because you have some very unique talents and skill sets and mindsets that you've honed over most of your life to put you in a possession to be the elite performers that you are. And many times with elite performers, it's easy to fall victim to that doesn't apply to me syndrome. I don't have to just pick one. He doesn't know who he's talking to. I can do multiple things. And you may be the exception, but why risk it? Why not just leave here and say, this is the one thing I'm going to change myself. And this is the one thing I'm going to do with my team and stick to that. And then once you've checked those off, then feel free to pick others. What is the one thing you are going to commit to do? And what is the one thing you are going to do with your team? It could be one of the exercises I laid out for you. It could be anything else. Anything else that you guys need from me formally in front of the group? Anything else I can help with? Like I said, I'm not gonna sprint out of here. I will hang out here as long as you guys need me. Thanks guys.